So you've just picked a camera up for the first time, you're probably having all the same thoughts and questions run through your head that everybody else has. Namely, what does that button do? What's this dial for? What does all that writing mean? And how did Donald Trump ever become president? Well, unfortunately, nobody has a clue about the last one, but today we're gonna try and answer the others. Let's go. So today we're gonna to have a look at some of the writing and the common buttons that you will find on most cameras. Now, all cameras have different button layouts and different ways that they address these buttons. So your camera may look a little bit different or some of the writing may be a bit different to what I'm talking about, but the functions will be the same. So firstly, let's look at the lens. Now, maybe your camera doesn't have a detachable lens, but will probably still have the same writing. So on the front of the lens barrel, you will probably have a load of writing around the edge of the outer glass. And part of it will say something like this. 24-105mm1.4. What does all that mean? So the first part represents the focal length of the lens. So the fact that there are two different values for the millimeters indicates that this is a zoom lens, which means that it starts at 24 millimeters at its widest angle and will zoom in to 105 millimeters. If you have a lens that doesn't zoom, then it will simply just say the focal length of whatever the lens is. So in this case, 85 millimeters. Next, what is this one double dot for? This is the aperture. So this means that the aperture ratio is one to four. So this is an F4 lens. Now this lens is 18 to 55 millimeters and then has one, two, 3.5 dash 5.6. So this means that this lens, like most common zoom lenses, actually has a changing aperture. So at 18 millimeters at its widest angle, the widest aperture that you can set this lens to is f3.5. But as you zoom in, that maximum aperture is going to decrease. So by the time you get to 55 millimeters, the maximum aperture that you can set this to is only 5.6. So some lenses have two aperture values, which means that the aperture changes as we zoom. However, this one only has one, f4. This means that regardless of focal length, the maximum possible aperture all the way through the zoom range is always f4. Also on the lens, you would usually find another value represented with a small circle and a line through it. In this case, it says 77 millimeters. This actually has nothing to do with the focal length of the lens whatsoever. It actually denotes the diameter of the front screw filters. So if I wanted to buy filters for this particular lens, I would need to make sure they are at least 77 millimeters wide. Then lenses are usually filled with a load of other letters that confuse everybody as well. So for example, on this Canon lens, we have EF, L, IS, USM. Or on this lens, we have EFM, IS, STM. So in Canon's case, EF denotes their full frame cameras, i.e. this lens will fit on any Canon DSLR. If it's an EFS lens, then that means it can only mount onto their crop sensor cameras, so won't mount onto a full frame body. If you're shooting Nikon, then these are usually denoted by FX and DX. Some of you may be confused and thinking what is crop and what is full frame, that's in the next episode. And EFM denotes that it is a mirrorless lens, so these will only fit onto Canon's mirrorless bodies. Now, all camera manufacturers will have different mount codes and different ways of portraying it. For example, with Sigma, full frame lenses are DG lenses, cropped censored lenses are DC lenses, and then mirrorless lenses are DN lenses. So the L just denotes that this is one of Canon's top grade luxury lenses. Different manufacturers have different ways of saying it. Some will have SP for special performance or something, but there will usually be a way of denoting what is their top line of lenses or not. The IS means that the, both of these lenses have image stabilization, which is an optical mechanism that will detect vibration from you holding the camera and will move the glass elements around to try and compensate for this. This means that you'll be able to handhold the camera at lower than normal shutter speeds and the pictures will still remain blur free. Again, different manufacturers have different ways of saying it. For example, Nikon use VR for vibration reduction. Tamron use VC for vibration compensation, Sigma use OS for optical stabilization, but they all do the same thing. Lastly, the USM and STM refer to their autofocus drives. 
So in the case of Canon, you have a USM, which means an ultrasonic motor, or you have STM, which means a stepper motor. And again, unfortunately, camera manufacturers can't use the same names as everybody else, so they all have different ones. So for example, Canon have USM, Sigma have HSM, Tamron have USD, but all of them denote what the motor mechanism for their autofocus is. So generally, the ultrasonic ones are very quick and quiet, while cheaper lenses might use a direct drive motor, which are a bit slower and a bit noisier. Then moving down the lens, you may have some writing that denotes a distance, in this case, 0.45 meters, or one and a half feet. This is generally to do with the closest focus distance the camera can achieve. So in this case, this camera can focus down to one and a half feet away. Now most camera lenses will usually have at least one, maybe two rotatable rings on there. So the one lens that most camera lenses have is an autofocus ring. This allows you to manually set the focus if you want to. The second one is usually a zoom ring, so is only ever found on zoom lenses. These are usually marked with focal lengths around the edge to give you some idea as to roughly what focal length you're setting the lens to. You may well then find some switches on the lens. Usually you will have one that is denoted by AF, MF or AM or something like that. This is whether you want the lens to be in autofocus mode or manual focus mode. So if you set it into AF or autofocus mode, whenever you take a picture, the camera is going to try and automatically focus the lens for you. If you, however, want to manually focus the lens because either the camera is struggling or it's something specific that you want to focus on, then you can set it to manual and the camera is going to forget about the focus and just take the photograph. Now, most lenses with a stabilizer built in will have a switch for the stabilizer. This will let you turn that on or off. And then on the back of detachable lenses, you will usually find a small marker. In the case of this, it's a red dot or it could be a white line or something. You will then find the same marker on the camera body. This denotes how you need to line the lens up in order to get it to mount onto the camera in place. So if your lens is detachable, then there is usually a button next to the lens mount that will unlock the lens for you to take it off. Most cameras will have a protrusion on the right hand side. This is called the grip. On the top of the grip is where we will find the shutter button for taking a picture. However, usually the shutter button has a two press system. So you can part press the shutter. This isn't gonna take a picture, but all of the systems in the camera related to taking a picture are gonna start up. So if the lens is in autofocus, when you part press the shutter, that is when the camera is going to try and acquire focus. If you have a lens with stabilization, that is when the stabilizer is gonna start up so that the camera is nice and steady for you to compose your photograph and then the light meter is going to show up on the back so you can see whether the camera thinks you're going to be exposed correctly for the photograph. So how do you see the light meter? Well, some cameras will have a screen on the top that will show you all of the settings and the light meter for you. However, most cameras will have it on the screen at the back or through the viewfinder itself. So we can see what settings we've got, but how do we change them? Well, behind the shutter button, you will usually find a rotating dial. This is normally to change the shutter. Some cameras will have different dials to change the different settings. However, most budget level cameras actually have all the settings changed with just the one. So in some cases, the dial on its own will just change the shutter. There will then be a button marked ISO. If you press ISO, it's gonna highlight the ISO setting in the menu so that when you then roll the dial, you're changing the ISO rather than the shutter. Or there will be a button that highlights the aperture when pressed and then rotating the dial is going to change your aperture setting instead. Once you're happy that the framing's correct and the light meter's correct, you fully press the shutter and you take a photograph. Once you've taken a photograph, there's usually a button on the back with a triangle on it. This lets you go into playback mode to see the pictures you've already taken. There's usually then a button with a magnifying glass that allows you to zoom into a photograph to make sure that the focus is correct and everything's how you like it. If you don't like it, there's a button with a picture of a bin on it to delete that picture. There is usually then a mode dial normally situated somewhere on the top of the camera. This allows us to select what mode we want the camera to be shooting in. So for example, most cameras will have a fully automatic mode. When set to automatic, the camera will just do everything for you. It will work out where it wants to focus, it will work out what settings it wants to use, and it will do the whole lot for you. You just literally point and shoot. The problem with this is the camera has no idea what we're trying to take a photograph of, so it's just gonna guess whatever settings it likes, but might not create the image that you want to create. A lot of budget level cameras will have other presets denoted by little pretty pictures, usually a picture of somebody's head, which is a portrait shooting mode, 
or a picture of some hills, which is a landscape mode, or maybe somebody running, which denotes sport shooting mode. These are still fully automatic settings, but if you set them into any one of these, you are at least giving the camera an idea as to what you're photographing so it can start to prioritize the settings accordingly. So if you set the camera into sports mode, it's going to prioritize a fast shutter because it thinks you want to freeze the action. It will then just work out the other settings to get the exposure correct. If you're shooting portrait mode, it's going to try and prioritize a very shallow depth of field. So it's gonna keep the aperture as wide as possible to try and isolate the person you're taking a picture of. And then we'll just change the other settings accordingly. All landscape mode will create a narrow depth of field by using a smaller aperture so you can get a lot of the subject in focus. Problem with these is they're still automatic modes. It's still guessing what you're trying to create. So a sports mode is great for stopping action, but maybe you actually want to create a little bit of blur. Or maybe you're taking a landscape photograph, you don't automatically need a really narrow aperture. Maybe you actually want a shallower depth of field in order to isolate a single subject within the scene. This is where the manual modes come into play. So cameras will usually have a manual mode denoted by an M. So this means that you then have full control over every setting. You control the focus points, you control the aperture, you control the shutter and the ISO which gives you the full flexibility to set whatever you want and create the image that you want to create. The problem with manual is if the exposure is wrong, you can't blame the camera. So that's just a quick rundown of the basic shooting mode and the kinds of buttons and writing you will find on pretty much all cameras. Don't worry if there are buttons that I haven't mentioned that you are finding on your camera. They are probably related to other settings that we just haven't covered yet and we will be covering at a later date. In the next episode, we're going to be delving into the differences between sensor sizes. So if you've got any questions, anything you're unsure about with your camera, leave your comment down below, but make sure you tell me what camera you're using. If you did like this video, a thumbs up's always appreciated, and hopefully I'll see you in the next episode.